Hello, welcome back to Oral Surgery Journal Club. Hope everyone is doing well. Today I'd like to talk about TMJ and some of the various adjunctive therapies out there to help treat TMJ, specifically hyaluronic acid along with um, corticosteroids and along with PRP. All three of them have been used probably for the last 30 years. Uh, orthopedists have been using it in other joints as well for treating TMJ and joint pain and joint function. So we're going to look at how effective they are and as a background we're going to just go over their mechanism and how they work. I have two different papers to look at. The first one is a relatively recent paper it comes from uh, I'm not familiar with the authors Dr. Derwich. So these are Polish authors. They did a fantastic job. So we're going to start with this paper because they also do a good job going over the biochemistry and the background and the mechanism of how these various adjunctive therapies work. Um, and then we'll get to the results. So let's start with hyaluronic acid. Uh, moving forward, I may just call that HA because the paper keeps in shorthanding, abbreviating it for HA. So a hyaluronic acid is a glycosaminoglycan, which is a polysaccharide of repeating chains. And it's principally involved with viscosity. So it lubricates the joint and it decreases the friction and it helps the joint basically survive the constant pounding that a joint is known to take. Uh, hyaluronic acid is synthesized by the synoviocytes type B and it forms a layer. It not only covers the joint but it also penetrates the articular surfaces and it has a bunch of different functions and it's interesting it has it responds to the pressure. So in sub-atmospheric pressure, it changes, it, it assumes a spheroidal conformation. And in, in above atmospheric pressure, then it changes to a linear form. So that's interesting and in that the different forms help it with its function. So either it lubricates or it provides nutrition. But HA is not only the, the only molecule involved with lubrication, oh, there's three other molecules, there's three in total, so HA along with lubricant and phospholipids, all three of them together involved with lubricating the joint. Um, interesting, there's different types of hyaluronic acid, there's high molecular weight and low molecular weight, so basically it depends on the length of the chain. Um, there is an enzyme hyaluronidase which will cleave these into and degrade the high molecular weight into low molecular weight and some of these studies have been taking a look at that and they noticed that this this phenomenon where HA degrades into smaller or into low molecular weight uh, HAs that happens primarily with aging with inflammation and it can also be seen in osteoarthritis so that's one thing if we're going to look at like joint fluid analysis that's something that we've learned over time and that's led us to this hypothesis that, hey, look, if we notice that HA is degrading and becoming low molecular weight, then theoretically, if we were to inject high molecular weight into the joint, well, maybe that will help prevent some of the arthritic changes that come with aging and inflammation. Um, right, they said. All right, so that's basically it for the biochemistry of HA. Let's go into steroids. The so steroids, uh, they work by anti-inflammatory and immunosuppressive effects. There is the specific pathway, we'll get into the details. It's, it's, this is a you know throwback for some people. This is the genomic pathway. So basically the steroids will bind with a steroid receptor. That will happen in the cytoplasm. Then together with the, the receptor, it will translocate into the nucleus where it will then activate or suppress transcription. And by doing that, it will interfere with uh, basically the immune response and the inflammatory response. Uh, that's one pathway, the genomic pathway, but they also are non-genomic pathways, which basically works through non-specific interaction with the cell membrane, so not the transcription mechanism. So via those two pathways, the end result is it will inhibit phospholipase, and phospholipase then downstream from that, that will, in, that will stop the biosynthesis of all three prostaglandins, prostacyclins, and leukotrienes. And by inhibiting all of that, then you're stopping the inflammatory cascade, and that will then prevent IL-1, IL-6, and TNF-alpha, which are all cytokines for inflammation, so it will prevent the inflammatory response. Uh, there's different formulations of CS. There's water-soluble and water-insoluble. Here's a nice little picture that shows this is the genomic pathway. So here's the glucocorticoid. It is binding with the receptor, GR receptor. Then together, the, the, st the steroid receptor then translocates into the nucleus, and then it suppresses different transcription. 
Um, like I said, there's water soluble and insoluble. The only difference here has to do with the, act, the, the duration of action. So death of mexosone is soluble in water, which means it will kick in faster, but it won't last as long. Whereas these are insoluble, so they form microcrystalline particulates. So it will in, the onset will be a little bit slower, but it will last longer. So things like methylprednisolone or triamcinolone, which I think a lot of people do use in the joint, they may kick in a little slower, but they last longer. So those are the different formulations. Uh, and thirdly, the biochemistry related to PRP. So PRP is autogenous blood that you take and then you spit in a centrifuge. And there's various techniques of trying to aggregate the, the platelets together. So normal platelets, right? In one deciliter, you see somewhere between 150K and 300K platelets. That's normal. And then when you put in a centrifuge to make PRP, you're basically concentrating that. And the idea behind it is that when platelets are con platelets in contained within platelets, uh, the alpha granules, within the alpha granules, you have all the growth factors, things like TGF and insulin growth factor and epidermal growth factor. So all these growth factors, in theory, should help for wounds healing along with hemostasis. The exact mechanism of PRP is unknown, but there were some studies that show PRP does stimulate chondrocytes to engineer cartilage, and that sounds fantastic when it comes to TMJ. So that's the biochemistry for the three of these, and all three of them sound fantastic, at least in theory. Now, what happens when they are applied you know, to patients? Does it actually find an effect? Is it effective? Does it help reduce pain or increase MIO? And so that's what this study looked at. So now let's look at the studies. He does so. This first study, this by these Polish authors, they found 16 studies to review that met their criteria, and they go through them one at a time. I'm going to skip some of this. I'm just going to go to the chart where they summarize it quickly, and over and over again, the common theme is no. Unfortunately, despite despite them in theory making sense, and you would expect them to do much, they didn't show much. So. First study, they, they did arthrocentesis alone versus arthrocentesis with HA, and there was no difference. Second study, they did low molecular weight versus medium molecular weight, and there was no difference. Third study, um, here they did find a difference, and I thought that was interesting. So here they did HA versus just saline, and the patients with HA did have a pain reduction. And we're gonna this tang study keep that on the side we're going to come back to that later because that, that was one of the few studies that did find a difference but it, oh, the common theme most of the studies did not find so this study looked at cs versus ha no difference next study looked at saline versus cs no difference next study this man Fredini, i'll give him credit he came up with tons of different protocols so single session two needle arthrocentesis single session two needle arthrocentesis plus cs plus low molecular weight HA plus high molecular weight HA. This protocol was five weekly sessions. This one was five weekly sessions with um, with arthrocentesis plus low molecular weight HA. And this was two needles versus single needles. So all sorts of different protocols, but bottom line, no difference. Uh, next study, HA versus CS. And here they did again see HA did have less pain than the CS group. So add that to the Tang study. There's the second study that found a slight, slight difference. Uh, again, we're going to go through this fast. Next study, no difference, no difference, no difference, no difference, no difference. Um, PRP was better than low molecular weight. Okay, no difference, no difference. So what do you take from this? There were 16 studies. I got to say like 13 out of the 16 found no difference. And then there were three that found a slight difference. So what do you take away with this? So you know, I don't, this is, it's interesting because I'm going to compare this to the next paper and they came out with a totally different uh, conclusion. But the, the authors of this paper basically say, look, if we're looking at arthrocentesis alone, we know arthrocentesis alone was pretty effective. Arthrocentesis reduces pain and improves jaw function, meaning MIO. We know arthrocentesis can do that. What about adding HA or CS or PRP? No, those didn't consistently... Uh, and reproduct, repro and consistently and reproducibly change any of the pain or the MIO. So therefore, why add it? Stick with what we already have. Arthrocentesis seems to be perfectly fine. And then they also mentioned that corticosteroids shouldn't be used many, many times. They recommend not more than four times per year because it's known to be chondrotoxic. I think that we're all familiar with it. Even if we are, were to do steroids, we wouldn't do too much of it. Um, again, the results when it came to PRP were not consistent and some of it was questionable. And so the conclusion is the additional supplements, who knows if they're any more beneficial than just simple arthrocentesis. So that's the conclusion of this study and I thought it was very interesting. Then 
I don't know, I came across another paper written, so that paper was 2021. This paper that I came across, this was written by Wolford and Ellis, so these are names that we're all familiar with. This study was also fairly new, but two years older, so 2019, and they did a meta-analysis, and I don't know how, they got different results and different conclusions. So for, you know, for an academic purposes, let's go through this paper, but let's do it rather quickly. So they don't spend so much time with the biochemistry, but they just jump right into it. One thing I found interesting, they had 36 papers, whereas the other Polish study only had 16 papers. But a lot of the papers were similar. So they mentioned the authors of the, the 36 RCTs that met their criteria, and I'd say nine of them were the same. Nine out of the 16 were repeated in this study, and then of course, there's gonna be you know 27 new ones that didn't appear in the Polish study. But you know, when they looked at these 36 papers, and I'll give them credit, they did a really good job plotting all the data together, they did find a beneficial effect. So they looked at overall, and then later they're gonna break it up to short term and long term. But right now let's just look at overall pain reduction. So anything to the left of this, of the zero means it decreased pain. And so anything on this side, anything to the left, it will favor the treatment. And if it were the right, and then it would just favor placebo. And look, Every single therapy was to the left, meaning every single therapy was better than just placebo. So let's start from the very bottom, the, the least effective, that was conservative treatment. And then physical therapy, a little better. Then arthrocentesis, a little better. And all the way at the top was corticosteroids and hyaluronic acid. Both of them were significantly better than the placebo, right? And so that's one thing when it comes to overall pain. And then when they looked at MIO or improving opening and jaw function, anything to the right will favor the treatment. This is increasing, the reason this was to the left is this is decreasing pain versus this chart is increasing opening. So increasing opening, it would be to the right. And here, a lot of the therapies were increased the opening. So conservative therapy was equal to placebo. And then basically, as you add adjunctive therapy, your MIO kept getting better. So arthrocentesis alone, arthrocentesis with corticosteroids, arthrocentesis with PRP, corticosteroids by itself, arth arthroscopy by itself, arthroscopy with HA, arthroscopy with PA PRP. And so clearly overall, you keep seeing that adjunctive therapies are helpful and they do have a benefit in both decreasing pain and increasing MIO. And then again, like I said, they talk about short-term versus long-term and they have all sorts of different pie graphs to look at it. And let's jump to their conclusions because this was fascinating. So they saw it in a very different light. They said, the literature when it comes to TMJ is controversial and to some extent contradictory. Thank you. I'm glad someone's recognizing it because it seems like the papers are all over the place and it's hard to get a very clear message and it's very hard to come up with clear therapeutic recommendations based on all the contradictory literature out there. But one thing is clear, and their takeaway, so instead, the first paper kind of said arthrocentesis and arthroscopy works. What are these three other adjunctive therapies add? And they said, oh, they don't really add much, so just stick to arthrocentesis. But this paper, this Ellis and Wolford paper, take a different approach. They're going to group arthroscopy and arthrocentesis along with the three others, PRP, HA, and CS. So all five of these things, they're going to group together, and they're going to say, look, these five things work. They work more than doing nothing. They work more than just conservative therapy. So one thing that's clear to take away is, you know, maybe we too much in the, historically we focus too much on conservative therapy and then maybe conservative therapy was always a first line and these are, these things would be viewed as a second line. But maybe we have to change that thought because these, there's nothing very, these are minimally invasive. There's nothing wrong with starting these, these arthroscopy, arthrocentesis or these injections right off the bat and that's the takeaway from this Ellis paper and I don't disagree with this paper either I just th I just think it's interesting it's kind of like an ink, ink study where different people can see different look at the same literature and come up with different uh, conclusions so they say when it comes to these five minimally invasive procedures and all of them are grouped together they all work better than conservative therapy both in the short term and the long term for reducing pain and increasing MMO and therefore oh, one second I lost my mouse. One more last little bit. Let's finish up. So he says, we're, he, now here, so according to the data, HA, that's the most effective for pain control. Fine. So if you're just looking to reduce pain, then hyaluronic acid has a role. That's in the short term. When it comes to long term, then HA or arthrocentesis or arthroscopy, all of them were pretty good for pain. When it comes to opening, the best thing for opening was arthroscopy or arthrocentesis. 
And anytime you want to improve arthroscopy and arthrocentesis, it seems like there is an effective benefit. It can be boosted by all three of these, PRP, HA, and corticosteroids. But again, he, I like the other paper. He mentions corticosteroids should be used with caution because it, it causes all sorts of, it's chondrotoxic, like we said, and he mentions a couple other things. In kids, it can cause growth inhibition, and it can cause heterotopic ossification, condylar erosion, resorption. So corticosteroids shouldn't be overly used, but certainly one or two doses is fine. And Finally, that's his, his bottom line is, in contrast to traditional concepts, mandating exhaustion of conservative therapy before even starting minimally invasive, we, we should re-look at that and say, hey, these minimally invasive things, they deserve to be implemented as a first-line treatment, and they should be considered rather early, and don't wait for conserv patients to fail over and over conservative therapy before getting into it, because like we said, there's nothing very invasive about any of these techniques. All right, so that's it for these two papers. Let me know your thoughts. Um, it's hard to come up with a takeaway, and I know the data is all over the place, but I hope you guys found that interesting. I certainly did, and we'll see what the literature continues to develop and evolve over time. I'll see you guys next week.